Nisim, I know you had a career before Judaism, actually an amazing career. I also know that you don't really talk much about it. So I want to take this opportunity right now to ask you straight out about your previous life and find out about your amazing career before you ventured into Judaism. It's a good question. Uh, I don't know how amazing I can say that it was. Uh, really, I was just uh, I was young. My parents were, were hip-hop artists. My mother was, my father was. So I really didn't have a shot at doing anything else. You know, I could have uh, been a janitor or something like that, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, I was always into music uh, at a young age. And uh, right around when I was 13 years old, I hooked up with a producer by the name of Vitamin D. Vitamin D at the time, I think was doing, doing he was doing things in the industry, smaller things, but working with uh, some big names at the time. But he was very well known in Seattle, and uh, we did uh, we did two records together. And from there, it led to me working with other managers and it opened me up to to new people. So it was how I started. From then, I uh, started re started performing before. A lot of crowds, and it just was one of those things that trickle and trickle, trickle. And one day, my uh, demo made it to the to the um, desk of an A and R, and I started getting calls from a record label. And um, at the time, also too, I was very, very involved independently, like trying to push my stuff every every second that I could. And um, I got a call from the A and R Virgin Records, and we started talking. And uh, it seemed like it was going to be something very hopeful. And I remember we got on a plane, we went to New York, we went to Slim Shady Records, we went to Atlantic, we went to uh, Dame Dash Music Group. This is right after the Jay-Z and Rockefeller uh, split with Dame Dash. I uh, met with Clark Kent to discover Jay-Z and Biggie Smalls. And uh, he wanted to move forward. At a conference call the next morning, it didn't go through. Uh, nothing was uh, looking that it was going to be so promise, uh, promising. So we decided to do it independent. And when we did it independent, it made a big splash. Uh, mainly locally and then it started to spread a little bit more in the region and things picked up. I'm seeing bodies loaded on a truck and if it wasn't for my trade it would be us. I'm staring at my mother in the line. Uh, and I started searching. And during that time of searching, I realized that, you know, I was searching for I was searching for God. And so I pursued that. And the more and more I grew spiritually, I found myself more and more disconnected with music. At this time, it was like everybody's like, this is all the hype is happening. I'm here about to release some of my sophomore record. And uh, that sophomore record, I remember having a meeting with my business partner. And I told him, I said, listen, this is going to be my last record. I don't want to do it anymore. But uh, what did he say? Uh, so he said, <laughs> he's very shocked. He's very shocked. You know, he didn't really know how to take it. We, at this time, we had finally made a platform to do what we wanted to do and and, and to take things to the next level. And uh, next was, uh, level means what? Like MTV? To the or? next level was 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 hopefully to eventually take our independent label and to get an imprint deal and to be able to put out you know our music nationally, internationally, and uh, along with other artists. But, you know, here I am, I felt that urge inside of me saying I can't go on anymore and what can you do with that? So I told him this is going to be our last, but I told him on the condition. I said, listen, I don't want any money from anything. I don't care what it makes or anything like that, any shows, anything. I didn't want money from anything. I said, all I want to do is be able to keep Shabbat and Yamin Tov. And that's it. And uh, no shows on those days. I don't get bugged and I get bothered or whatever. So we agreed to it and released that record. And it, and it made a big, I mean, nationally. I mean, uh, there were so many different people. I remember doing the release party. And the release party, people were crying, walking out of the, uh, walking out of the door. And, and it was one of those things that... You could feel the vibe, and something was in the record. The, the main, the first single we shot, and it ended up on MTV. I love you. Yeah, y'all know what it is. It's some of that uh, motivational music, some of that feel good. Uh, yeah, a new life, new day, new breath. Make moves, get through, do your best. That's what they say to you. Cause if the music takes who we are, then watch what they play to you. We came a long way from 
Always playing in the background It seems that they all wanna be where we at now We know it's much harder Raising a black child we at now it was on full rotation on MTV, and I had guys like DJ Premier, uh, who was a big, big legend in hip hop, you know what I mean? Really endorsing me. And the, the, just previous, right before the record, I did a uh, song on Jake One's uh, White Van music. And on that record, it was like people were saying, like, that's my fan. I'm on there with Busta Rhymes, Young Buck, and Little Brother was on there. I mean, you, you're talking about big names that were on this, uh, you know, in the hip hop world on this record. And Little Me from Seattle. Too little, but a little bit from Seattle, you know what I mean? Uh, and nobody was making a big splash, so set things up for that record. And then when it was on MTV, we're like, wow. And I went to New York and I got to meet with a lot of my favorite rappers. And they knew who I was. I didn't have to say anything, and people knew who I was. You know, these are big names people I've been listening to for years, and they knew who, you know, it was a very, 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 very eye open experience. Call me Seema, you can call me Nice. Call it whatever, just don't call it street. I will admit that back then I was a beast, but I traded for that big white When was like the turning point where you just said, okay, and you completely walked away from it? What, what, what was it? I think it was trying to, to, like I said, live in two worlds. It was very, very hard for me because, and it's not because music is bad, obviously, you know. It was because I, my relationship to it was one that wasn't one of holiness. It wasn't Kedusha in, the, in my relationship to the music. And because of that, I, I couldn't see how I can make the two work. I'm searching for God and trying to improve myself spiritually. And at the same time, I have music and I have rap music. And it's, and, you know what I mean? To try to find clean rap or something that was uh, really satisfying to the soul. I couldn't. So for me, I couldn't make it work. So I think coming to that realization that, you know, these are two different worlds, even though obviously I found out later on that I was wrong, but I, it, it, in my head it was divided. It was two different worlds and I couldn't make it work. In the last year, mm -hmm. Nisim exploded on the Jewish music scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, really 2016, I think, was a, was, was a big year. Um, music videos, one after another. Mm -hmm. and, and, and seeing you on, on the biggest stages in the world. Um, how did that happen? Tell us a little bit about that. It's a very good question. I think there's uh, two two words to describe that. Hashem Elech. <laughs> <laughs> Um, very interesting, you know, I released in 2013, I released a, um, I released a LP, it was titled Nisi. Um, there was some buzz around it, I did a, a video for Aish, Aisha Toa, uh, for, for Hanukkah. There was a little bit of hype and, and buzz, uh, but it wasn't like what it is, you know, today. Uh, and and over from from 2013 to 2015, at least when the Shemelech came out, I, I went into a place of really trying to find myself, and and in the midst of all of that, I was I, I was homeless with my family. I didn't know how I was going to. I, there was nights I slept in my car. Uh, I was in, I found myself in the lowest places financially, burden. I mean, you talk about like you know, and, and embarrassed. I was in a very very low place, and. Uh, by the time I, I got called to do uh, Hashem Elef, it was a mutual friend called me up and told me about the song, you know, with the, I was like, have you heard of Hashem Elef? You heard the song, you know, God Elba? It's like, of course, I know the song. My two-year-old doesn't stop playing and I'm tired of the song, actually, you know, if you want to be honest. But, uh, and, he, and he asked me about this. Uh, so I said, listen, you know, whatever I do, he, he, he found me from the Hanukkah thing. He knew, knew me from the Hanukkah thing in Asia, too. So, uh, he called God. God was interested in doing it, 
and uh, I was like, okay, let's do it. And so I remember going in to record it, and the first time I went to record those lyrics, you know, mind you, 2013, I released a record I was Jewish. It was a very amazing and positive, uplifting record, okay? But for the first time, when Hashem Melech was the first time that I openly spoke about Hashem in a rap. I never talked about God in a rap, like, openly like that, you know what I mean? So I think what it was is that I, I felt a sense of, like, freedom for the first time. Because if a guy talked to me on the side, Anytime, that's what I'm talking about. We're talking about Hashem, Avodat Hashem, we're talking about these things. But in rap, I concealed it because I still had this hope maybe that I can in influence the world and by, by keeping it. And I realized that it wasn't it wasn't true to my person. But the first time when I went in and I did Hashem Alech and I started speaking and Hashem, you know, I, I was teary. I was crying afterwards, you know. And uh, I felt something. So when that video, when that video came out, there was a lot of controversy because it involved rap. Right. And and there is there is a controversy about rap in in, in the Jewish music world and in general in the Jewish world, in the Shivish world. Right. Here's the question: Is rap kosher? That's, that's not so pashut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is rap kosher? Rap. You know, what we have today, when we listen to, obviously, when we look at uh, predominantly, I, I don't know a lot of clean rappers. I can't really say I know any. I, I don't, you know what I mean? So uh, I can't say that rap is kosher. What I came to the realization for myself is is that I have a certain koach. I have a certain strength. Hashem blessed me with a certain talent and a certain gift. And... I need to use that in order to glorify and magnify his name. That's it. And to spread his name into the world. So I took that and I used it. So the question really is, can rap be kosher? And it could be kosher. What decides whether or not music is kosher is not the genre. So Rabbi Nachman says, and look at Tamaran and Torah Gimel, in the, third, in the third Torah, he says, he defines very clearly what is and what's not a kosher musician. It's not defined on the, the genre, the style of music. It is based upon the musician himself. Are they working on themselves in Kedusha? Are they purifying themselves, working it? And then from that, because the, the expression of what comes out of a person is everything that's inside of them. So if you have, uh, you know, a, a, a clean and a, and, a, and a wholesome bottle pouring something out, that's what the liquid's going to be. If it's in something that's tainted and, and it's dirty and, not, and you pour that out, that's also what it's going to be. So, you know, I don't think that you could say, this genre could be kosher and that one can't. I mean, who can define that? But Hashem knows the heart of a person. And the people that have a true hergish, people that can feel, they have true feeling, they feel when something's coming from a pure or impure place. And it's also based upon the person giving it, on the person receiving it. Where are they holding? I wanted to ask you a little bit about the album. If you could tell us uh, what this specific album is about. What's the theme? What's the theme? So the name of the new record is Lamala. And I think it's just that. It's about going up, ascending, going up to, to, to the highest place and elevating, elevating oneself. Um, the, the, the record came about, I was, I was making Aliyah. <laughs> First, the record started way before that. Like I said, I was crying many prayers on being able to make this record and, and with nothing. I had like Zaman Chirotein and that was it. That was the only song I had and I was like this rain and I'll be able to make something and now I, I diving on the quality. I want it to sound like this. I want every little thing, the detail that, that I could think of, I, I, I prayed about. When we were making Aliyah, we are moving to Yerushalayim, leaving from Seattle. On um, the first day I got in, they were just, I had an email from a guy by the name of Yisrael Lau. He says to me, oh, I have a studio, and uh, the studio is in, uh, is, is in uh, Beit Israel, it's right by the Mir Yeshiva, blah, 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 check it out. So usually, whatever, you know, the first thing is you investigate. So we checked out, seen what was at the studio, I seen the equipment, I was like, this is amazing. And uh, he's got everything I need. And so I went to go meet with him, and we really hit it off really, really well. So me, him, um, and my brother-in-law, Yosef Brown, we got together and we started making this album. And to me, it's, it's a masterpiece for me because only is it, like I said, 
it's phonically everything's in the right place and it's and it's and it's amazing music good to the ear but it's from the heart and i was able to work on it with two amazing amazing years <laughs> <laughs> okay. so i want to talk a little bit about the message the message that you're trying to get out through your music so the, the the message i want to get out through the music is that no matter where a person is no matter how low a person is no matter what a person is going through even from that place, it's not my message. It's the message of the of the great, greats, greats, greats before me, including Remy Nachman, my teacher. Is that no matter where a person is in the lowest places, even there you can still find that shit. And even there you can climb out and you can. Rock. My whole story is that the whole everything, and I didn't create my story. I don't tell up my story to say that. Oh, look at all the Hashem chose me as a character in life and this is the story and everything that he cut out that he that he gave me so with that i had to realize what can i contribute to the world what can i contribute to yiddishkeit what what is my what is my contribution my contribution has to be somewhere within my area what was my life like what was i doing i look for the for the clues and the hints and i seen that i came from that and the shim brought me there so obviously it must be for me that with my music and with whatever clock that i have and i'm using it to bring people from the lowest places up to the highest place because that's, that's all i have to give that's all i have to give <laughs>